Hello there. Welcome to my channel. In this episode, I will play again as George Staubert, a tourist from America, and will find out more about the costume killer and the Templars which are inside the name of the game. One very long episode with George, but I hope you enjoy it nonetheless. If you like my videos so far, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the bell so you don't miss any of my videos. If you want a walkthrough of another adventure game, match game, hidden object game, or some adventure platformer or action game, you can write in the comments below. Enjoy! Later that afternoon. The woman was doing something with a pair of needles that couldn't be described as knitting. Oh, hi! Bonjour, monsieur. Would you like me to foretell your future? Uh, no thanks. I'm very good, it only takes a minute. Thanks all the same, but I'm not superstitious. Besides, if it only takes a minute, that's not much of a future to look forward to. Do you know a young woman called Nicole Collard? Yes, I do. She lives upstairs from me in the apartment block across the street. The door isn't locked, but you'll need to give it a gentle nudge. It sticks, you see, because of the damp. The landlord said he'd fix it before winter sets in. He's been saying that for three years. How long has Mademoiselle Collard lived here? A few months. She's in for a shock when the cold weather comes. Drafty windows, insufficient heating. It's a struggle to keep warm. The only reason I stay is because the rent is cheap. Your young lady, she deserves better. I thought Mademoiselle Collard was a successful photographer. Not as successful as she makes out for all her fine clothes. Oh, I've heard her crying herself to sleep at night. That's awful. Now don't you let on that I've told you. She's proud, that one. Too proud, if you ask me. Have you seen anyone out here watching Mademoiselle Collard's apartment? Yes, I have. A strange man. Tall and thin as a broomstick. He kept his face hidden. But I saw his eyes peering from evil little slits. How was he dressed? A long brown raincoat with an hat. Or like Humphrey Bogart? Yes, but he didn't have Bogart's charisma. Besides, this guy looked like he needed a toilet. You never saw Bogart clenching his buttocks like that. Is there anything else you can tell me about Mademoiselle Collard? No, monsieur. Are the flowers for sale? Oui, monsieur. Okay. I'll take a bunch of those white ones. I wouldn't do that if I was you. No? They are lilies, monsieur. Some people associate them with death. Yikes. Well, thanks for telling me. What other flowers do you have? Dahlias. What do they signify? Insecurity. Hmm. I don't want to give her the wrong idea about me. What about the tall yellow ones? Those are iris, the flame of passion. And the little yellow ones? Sensuality. Well, they're no use to me. I want to make an impression, not jump down her throat. I've changed my mind. Will you tell my fortune? You're going on a long journey. My, oh my. What a surprise. Can you tell me anything I don't already know? How does this fortune-telling routine work? If I knew that, I wouldn't be selling flowers for a living. Haven't you ever wondered why you were blessed with the gift? Well, it's a bit like satellite television, I suppose. Some of us are born with a built-in receiver dish. I just happen to be one of the lucky ones. Can you really foretell the future? Only time will tell, monsieur. The strange thing is, I can't seem to see myself in the future. Other people? I have no problem. But when I try to see what might happen to me, nothing. That must be scary. Maybe. I figure it's a kind of natural safety mechanism. Either that or I don't have a future. What can you tell me about this material? It's a very expensive piece of cloth, monsieur. Do you recognize this nose? No, monsieur. 
What can you tell me about this tissue? Nothing. See you later. That's right, monsieur. You win. It was the door to Nico's apartment. Remembering the flower seller's advice, I pushed the door gently just above the lock. Hi. Bonjour. I'm glad you could make it, monsieur. Uh, please, uh, call me George. Fine. I'm Nico. Take a seat, George. Eh bien? And what have you been up to? I've been exploring the sewers underneath the cafe. I thought I could smell something bad. The clown used the sewer to escape and to change out of his costume. I guess he was in a hurry. He left his jacket behind. And? I got his tailor's phone number. You had better luck than I did. Luck, she said. Luck. Hard work, I'd call it. What happened? My editor told me to drop the story. Can you believe it? But you're not going to do that. Oh, no. I'm going to find out what's behind these killings. It just doesn't add up. It almost feels like some sort of conspiracy. The police in three different countries have kept very quiet about the murders. The press don't connect them at all. They blame them on political, religious or militant minority extremists. Well, that covers just about everyone. Tell me more about yourself. <laughs> There's nothing much to tell. Well, how'd you get into photography? I guess I owe that to my father. He bought me my first camera. I was eight, and my parents had just split up. Did you live with your father? Yes. My mother went off with her new boyfriend. I didn't mind. Papa was all I needed. Four years later, he died in a plane crash. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. I don't mind talking about him. He was more like an older brother, really. Always joking and laughing. Papa always wanted me to study art. That's why I went to college. Did you learn about photography at college? God, no. I couldn't afford the materials. We were billed for everything we used. Paint, canvas, paper. Most of my year turned to minimalism. It was cheaper. I used to go poaching in the park for squirrel hair. The only time I wasn't hungry was the term I did printing. I used to eat the potatoes. You're making fun of me, aren't you? Oh, no. Tell me more about the clown's previous victims. The first was Arnaud Bellotta, the millionaire pharmaceutical baron. He made his money from amphetamines in the post-war slimming and diet boom. Imagine it. Millions of housewives literally speeding their butts off. The only witness in the case was his Filipino au pair. She swears he was lured to his death by a snowman. What about the clown's second victim? Yamada, the controversial Japanese politician. He inherited his fortune from his father's electrochemical consortium. How did he die? At the hands, or should I say flippers, of a giant emperor penguin. A snowman, a penguin, and now a clown. I had been about to add mine to the list, but stopped myself. I really didn't want to have to explain to George about my father's involvement with Cachon. You know, I hate to admit it, but this is scary. And I'll tell you this, I will not be accepting any invitations to costume parties. I don't blame you for being scared. I am too. But this story could be my only chance for a big break. Or an early death. I found a piece of material near the cafe. When I showed it to the concierge, he recognized it right away. It's very distinctive, all right. Just wait until you see this. I developed the film I shot at the cafe. Here, George, it's an enlargement I made. Look what that guy is wearing. Checkered pants. The same material as I found in the sewer. That's right. This guy shouldn't be difficult to find. Oh, no? Take a close look at his eye cheek. A scar in the shape of a horseshoe. Or a crescent moon. I found this tissue down the sewer. <laughs> That's disgusting, George. No, no, no. I think the stuff on it is grease paint. Like actors use, or clowns. It's still disgusting. Get rid of it. I found this false nose in the sewer. Hey, what's this inside it? The contents of someone's nose? Don't be gross, George. It says La Rite du Monde. Masks and costumes. It's a costume shop near the Gare Saint-Lazare. 
I'll check it out. Maybe the owner remembers who hired the clown costume. This is the tool I used to get into the sewers. Fascinating, George. You're not interested, are you? Oh, of course I am. I think it was very brave of you to go down those sewers. Yeah? Well, it was kind of scary, but... Well, I had a job to do. How come you enlarged this photograph of me? Because I noticed the guy behind you, of course. I have to go. Okay, I'll see you later. Paris, clown chasing. Visited Nico in her apartment. Turns out, her editor spiked the story. Seems some important guys are being assassinated by clowns and penguins, while the police are keeping quiet about the murders. Not quite the vacation I expected. Nico's sharp. When I showed her the material that I found in the courtyard, she gave me a photograph she took at the scene. It shows a man emerging from the courtyard, wearing trousers made of the same material, and there's a scar on his cheek in the shape of a crescent moon. Inside the clown's nose I found the name of the costume shop from which the clown suit was hired. Great lead. The guy's spoon-shaped face was mournful and humorless. He looked like a vegetarian in a slaughterhouse. Excuse me. Bonjour, monsieur. Please, come in. Welcome. Leave the mundane world behind. For in these four walls, fantasy is king. Uh, I don't want a costume. Didn't you ever dress up when you were a child? Not that I remember. Incredible. You'll be telling me next that you never shared your elder sister's lingerie. I don't have a sister, and I think I'd look pretty silly in a brassiere. I just need some information. Of course. How can I help you? Have you heard of a man named Plantile? I do not recall any one of that name. I'm looking for a man who hired a clown costume from you. Oui, monsieur. I do not see how I can help. Don't you keep a record of costumes that you've rented out? Of course, monsieur, but... Uh... Well, then, I'd like to check your records. Give me the names of everyone who's rented a clown suit. Impossible. There are too many. Do you want this red nose back? Not after it's been worn, thank you. Does this dirty tissue mean anything to you? Hmm. Let me smell that. Bestheimer's number seven, white pancake. Theatrical grease paint, right? Oh, oui, monsieur. La creme de la creme of Cespian accoutrement. Have you sold any of it recently? Yes, two can. Do you recognize this man? Ah, oui. He was ill this morning. That is the man to whom I sold the grease paint. I remember the scar on his face. He chose two costumes, Bozo the Clown and Seamus the Pixie. A pixie? Very smart. Green silk with a taffeta lining. He gave me his name as Monsieur Khan. So we know now the costume killer what name. This tool mean he is called Khan. Nothing, monsieur. Thanks for your help, buddy. My pleasure, Monsieur. Allow me to shake you by the hand. Huh? Uh, well, okay. What are you trying to do, kill me? You did not find it amusing? I never saw the funny side of electroshock therapy. Eh bien, it is yours to keep. A gift? Do I need a license? No, but I give you a word of warning, monsieur. What? Remember to switch it off before you visit the toilet. The guy in Nico's photograph, he bought grease paint from the costume shop and rented two costumes, Seamus the Pixie and Bozo the Clown. Apparently he called himself Khan. I'm on his trail.
Hello? Who is this? Mr. Todrick? Oh, it's you again. What now? The man I'm looking for is called Khan. He bought a suit from you, remember? Mr. Khan. Yes, I remember him. Yes, I delivered the suit to his hotel. The Hotel Ubu. Uh, I uh, don't remember the room number. It was upstairs. The second room on the right-hand side of the corridor. Thanks, Todrick. That's all I wanted to know. Now I've got you, Mr. Clown. Gave that Taylor Todrick another call. He finally admitted to knowing something, confirmed that the guy who bought the suit was called Khan. Apparently he's staying at the Hotel Ubu. I'm getting closer. The man looked like an amiable Bigfoot. Excuse me. Yeah? Have you seen a guy dressed as a clown? No, I ain't. Don't tell me I missed him. Oh, that's too bad. I love the clowns, don't you? I've seen daytime television that was funnier. I love it when the little guys get hurt. That figures. Custard bites, hose pipe down a pants, then smack a plank in the kisser. You ever meet a guy called Plantow? No, I ain't. You missed your chance. If you're quick, you'll catch him at the coroner's. Do you happen to know a guy named Khan? That ain't nobody I know. Do you recognize the guy in this photograph? Is this a trick question? No, I simply asked if you recognized him. Okay then. No, I don't. See you later. Not if you see me first. The woman was obviously English. She had all the qualities of Bodicea, Elizabeth I, and Margaret Thatcher rolled into one. It wasn't a pretty sight. Hi there, ma'am. Well, hello. What can I do for you? I'm looking for a man. You disappoint me, my dear. For one foolish moment, I thought. But never mind. Aren't you going to tell me your name? George. George Stobart, ma'am. How sweet! I once had a stable boy called George. I am Lady Piermont. The common reaction is to kneel and stutter, but it's not obligatory. A real lady? I mean, you're an honest-to-God aristocrat? Oh, I don't know about that. Few of my ancestors are honest, not even to God. I can trace my family back to the Normans, but don't let that intimidate you, George. Beneath that impressive pedigree, I'm just flesh and blood. The blood may be blue, but the flesh is the plump beef of old England, so to speak. You appear distracted, George. Is there any way I can help you? I'm looking for a murderer. Good heavens! You're a private detective. That's correct, ma'am. What's the term you Americans use? It's on the tip of my tongue. I believe what you're thinking of is Dick. Precisely. Have you come across a man who calls himself Khan? I am familiar with only one person named Khan. Genghis Khan, the legendary Mongol barbarian chieftain? No, darling. Kevin. Kevin Khan? I never heard of him. I'd be most surprised if you had, darling. He's a pharmacist in Hemel Hempstead. Organize these fundraising for the Rotarians. Lovely man. Does he have a scar on his cheek? I really wouldn't know, sweetie. Are you here in Paris on vacation? No, darling. I'm on holiday. I needed to get away after Algie's funeral. I didn't realize you were mourning the loss of a loved one. I'm not. He was my husband. I'm sorry to hear about your husband's death. You wouldn't be if you knew him, my dear. It gave me the opportunity to take a well-deserved holiday. Daphne suggested a change of scenery. Paris, she said. A wild romance is just what you need to take your mind off the inquest. Well, the closest I came to romance was being wooed by a drunken Breton chef. I must say I was disappointed with his cock van. Not at all what I was expecting. 
I was thinking of cutting my holiday short, packing my bags and heading back to Hemel Hempstead. That was until last night. What happened to you last night? I was stricken, Mr. Sturbot. Cupid's arrow has cleft my bosom. They couldn't really miss. It was just as I'd always imagined it should be. The intimacy of candlelight. Romantic music tinkling across the room. And then, a stranger's glance. Those brooding eyes, that suave manner, those tight trousers. He was the man I'd been waiting for all my life. I'm glad he finally turned up after all these years. Ah, but it wasn't to be. He was merely toying with my affections. And if I ever catch up with him, he's dead. Who was the guy who led you on? His name is Merlin. Did you know there's a gangster out front? What makes you think he's a gangster? The Italian suit and the bulge in his pocket? I know plenty of men with Italian suits and bulges in their pockets. That doesn't necessarily make them gangsters. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? My God, it's him! That's Merlin! She represented everything I loved about the English. The lady was totally deranged. Merlin? You mean King Arthur's wizard? Good heavens, no! Monsieur Merlin is a fellow guest. He's the man I've been telling you about. That's the man who spurned me. The man you know as Merlin is a fake. What do you mean, sweetie? He's a murderer. He also uses the name Khan. I am shocked, Mr. Stobart. Shaken. I took him to be a gentleman, a man of honor. Do you know, I'd rather like to assist you in stitching him up. When did you last see Merlin? It was no more than an hour ago. He came downstairs and spoke to that clerk chappy. Something passed hands. I couldn't see what exactly. A briefcase? No, smaller than that. A bundle of papers, perhaps. The clerk put it in the hotel safe and Merlin went out. Are you sure you saw Merlin putting documents in the safe? Yes, darling. Positive. I wonder what they were. Obviously something of great importance. Yeah. I'd sure like to get my hands on whatever it is. I'll bet they had something to do with Plantow's briefcase. Has Merlin returned to the hotel? No, he hasn't. Are you going to search his room? If I could get in there, I would. Met the most fantastic and insane English woman, Lady Piermont. She recognized the photo of Khan, but said he claimed to be called Morlan. He's been lying to her, toying with her affections, brave man. She's after revenge. I recognized the guy. It was the Nobel Prize winner from the country whose name I couldn't pronounce. Excuse me, didn't I see your picture in the news? You're that Nobel Prize winner from some unpronounceable Eastern European state. Yes, that is me, in person. I don't want to worry you, but... Have you had any threats on your life? You know, mysterious phone calls, letters made up of headlines cut from the newspaper. I don't know what you're talking about. Do you know a guy called Plantau? I don't know anybody in Paris. Oh, well, this guy's dead anyhow. Why do you ask me about dead men? I have seen enough of death to last me a lifetime. I'm, uh, sure you have. Have you seen a clown? I beg your pardon? The clown. A guy in funny pants. Have you seen him? My pants are from England. Marx and Spencer. They are a pleasure and a comfort to wear, with much support. I'm real glad to hear that. You know, it's good to know you Nobel Prize winners are human too. In my country, the people make do with string and egg cartoons. For pants? For everything. Oppression is the mother of ingenuity. Do you recognize this man? He calls himself Khan. Yes, I know this man. Why do you carry his photograph? I'm a private detective. 
What's your interest in Khan? He is an enemy of my people. You know he's a killer? Of course, amongst other things. Would you help me investigate Khan? That is not possible. My instructions are to observe. I cannot jeopardize my position as an honored guest of this country's government. Thanks for your help. Goodbye. The sign on the door read 21. If the tailor's description was correct, this was the killer's room. The sign on the door read 22. The door was locked. The sign on the door read 22. The door was locked. Hanging from a brass hook was a key and a plastic tag. The clerk wore a disdainful expression like he'd been born with it. I want some information. Who are you? The police? I'm conducting a private investigation. Ah, I know only too well what you mean. That is one of the drawbacks of the catering business. When people book into an hotel, they leave their morals at home, no? I'm looking for a man who dresses like a clown. This is a highly respectable hotel, monsieur. There are no clowns here. If you say so. Do you know a man named Plantau? No, monsieur. I'd like to retrieve something from your safe. Ah, oui, monsieur. May I see some form of identification? Uh, like what? A driving license, perhaps? I don't drive. Your passport? I don't have it with me. I could show you my operation scar. I'm sorry, monsieur. I must have some form of unique ID. You won't find a more unique ID than my scar. I'm sorry. I must insist on a more traditional identification. Rats! Do you have a guest by the name of Khan? No, monsieur. Perhaps you would care to check the register. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? Yes, monsieur. That man is one of our guests. What name? <laughs> I cannot tell you that. It's Merlin, isn't it? Alias Khan, the clown. I told you, I cannot tell you that. The man who calls himself Khan has a scar on his right cheek. Vraiment? I tell you, I do not know a man named Khan. Maybe not, but I'd noticed a change in his expression when I mentioned the scar. Excusez-moi, monsieur. What? You are trying to steal that key, no? No way. What now, monsieur? About the key hanging on the hook over there. Oui, monsieur. Which room is it for? Number 21. Is that room taken? No. The guests checked out this morning. I'd like to check into room 21. That is not possible. How come? You said it was vacant. It is reserved for another guest. Rats. No, monsieur. Dutch. I believe Khan, the man with the scar, is also known as Merlin, the man who has taken room 22. What of it? What do you want? Access to his room. Do you have a license, monsieur? Huh? A private investigator's license? Well, not exactly, but I can explain everything. I am sorry, but without credentials, I cannot help. Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now?
Would you distract the clerk while I borrow a key? Are you asking me to aid you in a criminal act, darling? Oh, no. It's the key to an empty room. And why, may I ask, do you wish to gain access to an empty room? Do you plan to squat? No, ma'am. Scouts on up? I was never in the Boy Scouts, ma'am. Oh, you should have been. What were your parents thinking of? It's a fine way for a boy to get licked into shape. Now tell me, why do you want to get into that room? It's next to the room the killer is using. Ah, so you plan to eavesdrop on Merlin? I was hoping there might be a connecting door. Well, how can I refuse? I shouldn't think my feminine charms would be much use in this case, but a good dose of English arrogance might do the trick. Lady Piermont is very good at what she is doing. I say, you there, flunky! Oui, madame. Listen carefully. You do understand English, don't you? But of course, madame. Good. I wish to deposit some jewellery for safekeeping. I understand. Are you quite certain? Oh, bien sûr, madame. Over to you, my dear. Now maybe it wasn't the right room, but this was the right key. It was a massive mahogany wardrobe. There was nothing in the wardrobe apart from a vague, lingering smell of camphor. A cabinet stood beside the bed. The cabinet was empty, but it smelt of onions. No kidding, it really did. The bed was several times larger than the narrow cot I'd been given at the place I was staying. The bed was freshly made, and the crisp white sheets told me nothing about the killer's habits. Hmm. It was the battered leather briefcase I'd seen Plantar carrying just before he died. I searched the interior of the briefcase, but as I'd half expected, it was empty. The cabinet had no drawers, just a single door. The assassin had been too smart to leave incriminating evidence beside his bed. The closet was a solid, impressive piece of antique furniture. It was calm. I had the kind of feeling in my stomach that would usually send me running to the bathroom. A 
As Khan opened the wardrobe, I was sure I was dead. But he grabbed his pants quickly and didn't even see me. I didn't usually spy on men getting changed. But this guy was a killer, and I didn't want any surprises. He left his checkered pants on the bed. That was so close. Just as I was searching Khan's hotel room, he came in. I hid in the wardrobe. My heart was thumping so hard, I am amazed he didn't hear me. I wondered if the guy was colorblind. I had that kind of feeling you only get from searching still warm pants. There was nothing in the pocket. There was no bulge in the pocket. The pocket was empty. A strip along the side seam of the pants had been unpicked, then sewn back up with strong thread and a special stitch. I flipped the pants over. It looked like there could be something in this pocket. I found an ordinary matchbook. No matches, no clues. But as I pulled it from the pocket, a strong thread came with it. The thread with a metal tag on the end. I pulled on the metal tag and the thread came out of the pants. It was like pulling out a ripcord. I turned the pants over again. I searched the pocket gingerly and found a pass card. It read, Thomas Merlin, Gruber Electronics Corporation. The matchbook bore a pattern of swirling color and the words, Club Alamut. He's left his trousers on the bed. I found a matchbook with the name Club Alamut and a fake electrician's ID card. It was the card I'd found in the hotel bedroom. It read, Thomas Merlin, Gruber Electronics Corporation. What now, monsieur? Does this pass mean anything to you? That is Monsieur Merlin's property. That's right. Merlin the murderer. I want to see what he's left in your safe. Impossible. I cannot betray his confidence, no matter what you say he's done. You're making a big mistake. Maybe. I can live with that. A murderer? Are you sure? Positive. Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now? I found this pass in Merlin's room. So, that deceitful little man is passing himself off as an electrician, is he? Uh-huh. This guy probably has a million faces. I showed the pass to the clerk, hoping he'd give me Merlin's papers. But he wouldn't buy it. He's too scared. I'll give him something to be scared of. George! We will watch Lady Piermont again in her powers. Did you place a package from Merlin in the hotel safe? I did, madame. And did my friend here show you Merlin's identification? Indeed he did, but... What's the problem? He isn't Merlin. A mere academic detail. Give him the package. But... That is against the law. I happen to be a justice of the peace, you silly man. I am the law. If he tries anything, shoot him, George. My pleasure, Lady Piermont. One moment, please.
You know, I haven't enjoyed myself this much since Greenham Common. I don't know what I would have done without you, Lady Piermont. Voila, monsieur. Le manuscrit de Monsieur Merlin. Thanks. How satisfying. An Anglo-American alliance that actually worked. The clerk had given me a tightly rolled sheet of parchment. I decided not to unroll it until I was safely back in Nico's apartment. Lady Piermont is fantastic. If I were a couple of hundred years older. After helping me get the room key, she then worked her magic to get me Khan's stash out the hotel safe. It turned out to be an ancient manuscript. So that was what Plantard was killed for, but why? It was the ancient manuscript which Khan had stolen from Plantar. I couldn't leave the hotel with the manuscript. It was probably what those thugs were looking for. I knew this was no way to treat an ancient manuscript, but I couldn't let it fall into the hands of the goons waiting outside. Just a minute, monsieur. What's your problem? No problem, if you cooperate. What do you want? Just a routine security check, nothing to worry yourself about. Oh, well, all right. Search him, Flap. You bet! Hey, knock it off. Get off, you big ape. Nothing, Guido. Zilch! Our apologies, monsieur. What? I had to report you to the authorities. Randir, we are the authorities. You want I should break his arms? No. Let him go, Flat. If the manuscript was what Flap and Guido were after, they were going to be disappointed. I couldn't wait to get back to Nico's apartment and check it out. Back in Nico's apartment. Hi, how are you? Oh, hi. Come in, Josh. What are you doing to help trace the killer clown? Research, Josh. Yeah? You have a copy of the clown's yearbook? I have a telephone and lots of contacts. Oh. Well, did you find anything useful? Not yet. I'm employing my first and most useful weapon. What's that? Patience. Oh, I've heard of that. Isn't it a substitute for decisive thinking? Do you have a boyfriend? Not anymore. There was someone. A guy in my final year, but it didn't work out. Neither did my degree. I'm sorry. I'm not. Tell me more about your family. When I was a little girl, I used to spend the winter with my grandfather and grandma. They were the best times. Warm and safe in their tiny cottage. My grandfather rolled cigarettes while Grandma made hot chocolate and cakes. One day, he stopped his groaning. He put the lid back on his tobacco jar and took me in his arms. I laughed and wriggled, but he hushed me to be silent. With his unshaven chin all scratchy in my ear, he told me his secret. What did he say? He said, I don't smoke, but she likes to think I do. What a weird old man. Don't call my grandfather weird. He was the nicest guy ever. I wish I was back in that cottage instead of this crummy apartment in this noisy city. I found this matchbook in the killer's hotel room. It's from the Club Alamut. Never heard of it. Is there anything written inside it? 
No, what were you expecting? If this was a movie, there'd be a clue. A name or an address? That's no use. There aren't even any matches in it. Oh well, I'll keep it as a souvenir. I found this in the killer's room. What is it? A credit card? ID. Thomas Merlin of the Gruber Electronics Corporation. Never heard of him or the company. You're just not going to believe what I found. It's not another part of the clown's costume, is it? It's a medieval manuscript. Khan left it in the safe at the Ubu. It's incredible. Is this what he took from Plantark? It could be, which means it's worth enough to kill for. Look there, two guys on the same horse. Oh, yeah. Maybe they couldn't afford one each. What of it? Have you ever heard of the Knights Templar? Their official seal was an image of two knights sharing a horse. Whatever this manuscript means, it's connected with the Templars. How come you know about these knights? I learned about them while writing an article on the Crusades. Now, we will learn more about the Templars and their hidden treasure. The game's name this is connected with them but still not sure how. Arrive one day at the court of King of Jerusalem. He offered to protect the Christian pilgrims from the displaced Muslim armies. The king would be able to guarantee safe transit to Christians in the Holy Land. Safer journeys meant more pilgrims, and pilgrims meant trade and wealth. The Templars proved invaluable to the king as a mercenary army. It was said that they never asked how many the enemy numbered, just where they were. And as the years went by, the Templars grew in wealth and number. They were so rich. Even kings came to them for loans, but at the height of their power, they fell foul of the King of France. He rounded them up and turned them over to the Inquisition. Thousands of Templars were subject to torture and confessed to heresy. Of course, at the end of the Inquisition, there wasn't much they wouldn't confess to. The last Grand Master Jacques de Molay was burned alive. Jeez, so the treasure is hidden waiting to be discovered? If there ever was a treasure, it's been lost for 600 years. Anyway, we're supposed to be investigating a serial killer, not a medieval treasure trove. But maybe that's what the clown and his accomplices are after. Maybe this manuscript is the key. You'd better leave it here for safekeeping. Let's take another look at the manuscript. Look there, two guys on the same horse. There's a guy with a sword and a bull. The only mythological bull I know of is the Minotaur, but he was only half bull. I don't think I'd like to be half a bull, even if it was the bottom half. What's that object between them? It looks like a gem on top of a tripod. There's a guy working on a loom. He's weaving a carpet or a tapestry. Or a duvet cover. It's a clue to a place, I reckon. Somewhere famed for weaving and ships. Where folk live in barrels? It beats copper boxes. A knight with a crystal ball. Now, there's something written on the scroll beside the knight. Yes, but it's written in Latin. Per disciplinum mea lux videbis. By my teachings you will see the light. You speak Latin? Where did you learn a trick like that? A trick? I studied law, okay? I can read Latin. Ma, you're touchy. Tell me that again. There's a woman looking at her reflection in a mirror, but the reflection has three hideous faces. She reminds me of the Wicked Queen in Snow White. She was the one who said mirror, mirror on the wall, wasn't she? She made me cry so much when I was a kid, Mom carried me out of the movie theater. She didn't frighten me in the least. Like I said, I was only a kid. I didn't like the crocodile in Peter Pan either. Let's face it, we need help, George. Someone who knows about these things. Who do you suggest? Indiana Jones? I know a guy who specializes in medieval studies. His name is Lobino. Huh. <laughs> Some stuffy old fossil who gets horny over ancient relics, I suppose. Far from it. Andre isn't the stereotypical professor you have in mind. Where can I find this Lobino guy? At the Krun Museum. I'll give you the address.
I have to go. Okay. Don't forget to look for Lobino at the Kron Museum. Showed Nico the manuscript. I think she was impressed. How could she not be? She knew right away that it was something to do with the Knights Templar, a hugely powerful medieval order with too few horses to go around, or something. But they had hidden treasure. The attendant had an air of self-importance, and the kind of steely eyes that never seemed to blink. Pardon me. Oui, monsieur? Are you Lobino? Oh, no. Fancy you mistaking me for him. No. I am the deputy custodian. But Lobino does work here. Work? I wouldn't go so far as to call it that. He studies here most days, but as you can see for yourself, not today. Do you know anything about medieval manuscripts? Not me, monsieur. I am no scholar. Though people often mistake me for one. It is the uniform, I guess. They see the clothes. They are impressed. And they ask you to park their cars? They ask me to park the... No, no, no. They assume I am an authority on the exhibits in my care. Whereas you know next to nothing about history. Of course not. All I am saying is... I am no scholar, not like Monsieur Lobino. Do you know anything about the Knights of the Temple? No, sir. Not a sausage. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? No, monsieur. Is there any reason why I should? I guess not. Thanks for your help. In the case was a spindly tripod blackened with age and pitted with rust. It was identical to the tripod pictured on the manuscript. A notice identified it as 15th century from Western Ireland. It had been found in Loch Marne at the site of a Knights Templar preceptory. Ireland! What's that? This tripod was found in Ireland. I will have to ask you to keep your voice down. I'm sorry, I was excited. Paris. Krun Museum. The tripod from the manuscript, it's in the Krun Museum right here in Paris. According to the plaque, it was discovered in Lochmarn, Ireland. As I reached toward the display case, a shrill piping filled the air. I froze, then tried to get myself together and act nonchalantly. No, monsieur. No. Eh, no. Okay, okay. The metal rod attached to the wall was connected to the window. The totem pole looked distinctly out of place in the setting of the museum. Watch out! You'll have that done on top of us! It was an ancient Egyptian sarcophagus, with a beautifully painted effigy of its owner on the lid. This is ridiculous. I could be here for hours. in Nico's apartment. Hi. I've been to the Kroon Museum. Did you speak to Lobino? No, he wasn't there. I found the tripod. Where? In the museum. It belonged to the Templars. It was dug up in Ireland at a place called Loch Marne. I have heard of Loch Marne. I read an article about the castle. Take a look for yourself. 
A popular gossip magazine? You read that rubbish? No, I write it. Professor Nigel Pegram excavating the medieval castle at Loch Marne. That's strange. What? He resigned his chair at Durham University in order to devote his time to the excavation. Not only that, but he canceled the filming of a fourth series of his popular television program. This site at Loch Marne must be awful important to him. He's a professor of history, Daryl Cuckoo. All the same, I'd like to talk to this Professor Pegram. How do you feel about a trip to Ireland? Disappointed. Huh? That I won't be going. I want to follow up the Belota case. If you really think Pegram's gem is important, why don't you visit Loch Marne? On my own? I'm not so sure about that. Where is Ireland exactly? Have you found out any more about the murders? Well, it may be nothing, but both the clan's victims visited Paris earlier this year. When? The second week of July. They were both here at the same time. Did they meet? I don't know, but I can't imagine it was coincidence. I have to go. Okay, I'll see you later. Now, for the first time, I can travel to different country with the help of the map. Cool. A few hours later. I passed the castle on the way into Loch Marne. The castle where Pegram's excavation was located. Ireland, the Loch Marne gem. Loch Marne, what a beautiful village. Nico and I must really be onto something here. Ancient manuscripts, the Knights Templar, and a tripod from a medieval manuscript. All I need is the gem that goes with it. I will start by asking the locals about Pegram and his dig. It was a featureless plastic box firmly attached to the wall of the building. I tugged at the plastic cover, but it didn't move. The lad was doing his best to express his adolescent aggression. His effort was somewhat diminished by the fringe of milk on his lightly feathered upper lip. Hi there! What? What's your name, kid? Who are you calling, kid? Who the hell are you? Rosso's the name. Murder's my game. Are you a detective? Let's just say I'm here to find the truth. Cool. Just like on the telly. Cut the crap and tell me your name. Liam McGuire. What are you doing hanging around the bar, McGuire? I'm on the run. From me dad. Why? Did you do something bad? I ain't done nothing, boss. You can tell me, kid. Is it your dad? Oh, sir. He drinks every last penny down his evil throat and leaves the poor old mother bedridden and dying of presumption or trying to buy her medicine. Chopped firewood for father Mahoney till me fingers bled. The old skin flint cheated me too. But I took the pennies he gave me back home. Look, ma, says I, see what your darling son has earned with his own sweat and blood. When suddenly, me dad appears and grabs the loot. I'm off to Dublin, heavy drinking, says he. Watch out till I get back. That's why I runned away. Something in the grin on his face told me he wasn't being strictly truthful. Compared to him, Huckleberry Finn was a candidate for Altar Boy of the Year. What can you tell me about the castle, McGuire? What do you want to know? Well, can I get inside? No. It's locked up. Does anyone live there? No. Only, what do you want to know? Oh, nothing. You know something about the castle you're not telling me, don't you? No. What is it you're covering up? Is it something you're scared of? I ain't scared of nothing. I'll give you one last chance to tell me about the castle. Oh, yeah? And what if I don't? Then I'm taking you back to school. Oh, there's a ghost. It's called the Phantom of Loch Man. You're not telling me you believe in ghosts, are you? Mister, I seen it with me very own eyes. Last Tuesday night, I went up to see what that dig was about. 
I just reach the top of the wall when I hears this awful noise. What sort of noise? A horrible snuffling and snorting, like O'Brien's pig, only worse. It was coming from inside the castle. Did you find out what was making the noise in the castle? No fear. I just sat there on the wall like Humpty Dumpty. The moon was cracked and greasy like an old dinner plate. The yard was full of shadows that could have been hiding anything. I would have gone home, but my legs had lost their stuffing. Did you get to see the ghost? Indeed I did. And a fearsome sight it is too. I sat on my ass, waited while the moon went down. Then out it comes from the shadows, all grey and tattered and hunched over like an old bent willow. Then I hears this spluttering and splashing and horrible laughter in the dark. I was so scared. Why, I fell off the bloody wall. I'm sure there's a rational explanation for what you saw at the castle. There is. The bloody place is haunted. Have you seen a guy dressed as a clown? Here in Lochmarne? They all dress like clowns. The man I'm looking for is a dangerous psychotic. Jesus? It's just like that film I saw. Did this clown see? And he's after this kid who saw him kill a guy. He tries to warn the sheriff, only no one believes him. Then, while he's in the tub, the clown cuts him up with a chainsaw. My God! That doesn't sound suitable for a kid like you. Who are you calling a kid? I'm 25. Yeah, right. You're not a day over 14. Oh no, it's 25 that I am. Married with a car and three kids. Ten kids if you count the wives. Do you know a man called Pegram? Can you describe him like on the telly in the cop shows? He's an English archaeologist. I know the man you mean if he's the one. Can you tell me where I'd find Pegram? No, I can't, because he's not here now, but if I sees him, I'll ask him. Do you know what Pegram was doing in the castle? Digging for buried treasure. Jewels and gold and skeletons, like in the films. Have you ever seen this man before? What a slimy character. No, I never seen him. See you later, kid. Okay, mister. The young red-haired guy was plainly nervous about something. My name's George. Pleased to meet you, mister. My name's Fitzgerald. What can you tell me about the castle? There's nothing there. Just an old ruin. How old? I really couldn't tell you. Have you ever explored the castle yourself? I used to play there sometimes, when I was a kid. Then one of the little ones fell off the wall, broke his head and died. We didn't go there anymore. You haven't been up there recently? No. Do you know Professor Pegram? He's the archaeologist, isn't he? That's right. Did you work at Professor Pegram's dig? <laughs> what gave you that idea? Can I get you another drink? Oh, no thank you. I shouldn't be drinking at all. I'm on tablets of my nerves. More than a pint and I'll pass out. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? No, I'm sure I don't know him. See you later. It was a beer-stained piece of toweling. The white whiskers on the bartender's flushed face were like garlands on a Christmas tree. The resemblance ended there. The top of his head was too slick and shiny to act as a perch for a Christmas angel. The guy sat in the corner as if he was a permanent fixture. I'd been taught not to judge people by their appearance or their clothes or the length of their hair. Nobody ever said anything about runny noses. Hi there, old timer. What? Nasty cold you've got there. As soon as the words left my lips, I regretted them. Is there such a thing as a cold which isn't nasty? I put the question to Father Mahoney. Father, says I, why were we born to suffer snot? What did he say? 
He said, it's my reward for being out all night like a sinner, pious prig. Anyway, this is no ordinary cold. It is the hay fever. Polynosis? Thank you. You're not a policeman, are you? Excuse me? Police. No. I'd know it if you were. Can you tell me how to get into the castle? Don't even think about it, me bucko. Lockbarn Castle is haunted. That's what the kid outside told me, but I don't believe it. Then you're a fool. Ghosts don't bother me. I still want to visit that castle. You can't. It's not open to the public. There's no one around to stop me, is there? That's right. Nothing human, anyhow. Have you ever seen the ghost? To be sure. With me very own eyes. Can you describe the ghost? It was horrible. A wee, stunted beast. Long beak, straggly, flappy wings. Are you sure it wasn't a wild animal? A rabbit or a skunk or something? Skunk? In Loch Mar? That'll be the day. No, that was a ghost, to be sure. I think I know what you saw on the castle wall. I know what I saw. I don't think so. It was the kid, McGuire. What? He was up on the wall last Tuesday night. He thought you were the Phantom of Loch Mar. Oh! Do you know Pegram, the archaeologist? That's the scrawny fellow who was poking around at the castle, isn't it? No, I don't know him. What's that you're making? It's a necklace, me poco. Oh, sure. Made out of steel wire? <laughs> That's right. A necklace for my pretty one. When my little lover feels it round her slender neck, she'll be mine. All mine. <laughs> Can I buy you a beer? Very kind, I'm sure. But I don't drink the stuff Leary sells. What's wrong with it? I've seen what it can do. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? I can't tell without me glasses. I'll see you later. Um, will you? Look. To get the blue wire from the old man, you need to watch him until he put it on the table and when he start to sneeze quickly to grab it. You'll need it later in the game. You might need to try that few times until you take it. Keep your pay can As soon as the old guy looked away, I grabbed his piece of wire. It was a short piece of wire, twisted into a rough circle. It was a beer-stained piece of toweling. It was a beer-stained piece of toweling. The white whiskers on the bartender's flushed face were like garlands on a Christmas tree. The resemblance ended there. The top of his head was too slick and shiny to act as a perch for a Christmas angel. Top of the morning to ya! I beg your pardon? Well, that's what you Irish say, isn't it? Do you want something? Or are you just flaunting your xenophobia? Well, I, I was trying to be sociable. <laughs> Is it a room you're after? No, thank you. I don't plan to stay too long. Who does? Most folk take one look at Loch Martin and jump back on the bus. Have you served any, uh, clowns recently? No. You're the first today. Do you know a man called Pegram? Indeed I do. Are you a friend of his, by any chance? Oh, no. I'm just trying to track him down. Me too. That son of a bitch should be locked away. Did Pegram stay here? 
Yes, he did. Six nights plus breakfast. I'll try a glass of beer, please. Is this your first pint of real ale? Uh, well, I guess so. What's real ale, anyhow? Beer that's grown from natural ingredients to traditional methods. It shouldn't be kept under pressure or refrigerated. And finally, it should have a good body and distinctive character. In other words, it's flat and worn with bits in, and it makes you fall over. Do you recognize this man? No, I don't. What do you want with him? I've got a score to settle. I don't want any trouble in the bar, mister. If it's a fight you're looking for, see Father Mahoney. A priest? A man of the cloth? Sure. And he teaches the boys how to box at the youth club. According to Mahoney, it develops character. Isn't that right, Pat? Didn't he teach you all the art of pugilism? Dial. Sorry, Michael. I was miles away. What did you say? Ah, never mind. Look, I gotta be going. There was a vacant look on his cow-like face that said quite clearly, nobody home. Hi, my name's Stobart, George Stobart. Hello there, mister. What can I do for you? Do you know Professor Pegram? Do I know him? Do I know the good professor himself? No, I don't. I mean, I know who he is, but I don't know him to talk to. Do you know anything about Pegram's excavation? Only that he didn't have the right tools for the job. What he needed was shovels and a JCB. Pegram was digging for historical remains, not coal. Is that a fact? What the hell for? Is the science of archaeology part. Understanding how people used to live by what they've left behind. One day archaeologists might be digging up our remains. Imagine that, Mr. O'Brien. I wonder what they'll find. Well, it won't be arrowheads and beakers. Fast food cartons and flavored condoms, more likely. Did anyone from the village work at Pegram's dig? I tried it myself, but that high and mighty history man called me incontinent. What a nerve. Hadn't I dug more holes than the rest of them put together? Do you remember seeing Sean Fitzgerald at the dig? Hmm. Let me see now. I think me brain box needs a spot of lubrication. Can I buy you a drink? You most certainly can. Give me a drink for my friend here. Who? No. Doyle? No. Has he conned you into buying for him? Shame on you, Patrick. Same again. Just a point this time, Michael. One point of brown coming up. Do you remember Sean Fitzgerald now? I can picture the scene as if it was only last week. Come to think of it, it was only last week. Fitzgerald was there all right. Him and a bunch of students. He was speaking with the boss man. Can you tell me anything about the castle on the hill? Oh, I don't know much about anything. You should ask Mr. O'Brien here. He just joined up writing. Would you be one of them history fellows yourself? That's right. Professor Stobart, Miskatonic University. You're an archaeologist, and you're asking us about the castle. Excuse me, Mr. O'Brien. The gentleman was talking to me. How come you didn't leave with the others? I didn't know they'd gone. Oh, yes. Packed their spades and shovels, and away they went. Seems I missed all the excitement. What excitement? Do you recognize the man in this photograph? It's a handsome mug on that fella, to be sure. Is he a film star? Bye for now. Hello there. Uh, my name's George Stobart. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Hey, am O'Brien. Uh, can I help you? Do you know Sean Fitzgerald? Yes, I do. What you want with him? I want to talk to him about working at the dig. I can't imagine anyone implying Sean Fitzgerald on a dig. He wouldn't know a post hole from his elbow. Have you heard of the Phantom? More than that. I've seen it. And let me tell you, it's a dreadful spectacle. So it's not just a local legend. There really is a Phantom of Lochmore. Oh no. I was talking about the Phantom of the Opera. 
Have you ever heard of the Knights Templar? I most certainly have. A remarkable institution. Did you know, they were the originators of our system of credit. Their financial empire stretched from the Atlantic to the Caspian Sea. With bases in so many countries, they had to establish new methods of fiscal transfer. So, the Knights Templar were nothing but a bunch of bankers. I don't get it. Are you saying these Templar guys invented bank charges? In a matter of speaking, I suppose they did. What a dirty trick. Didn't anyone try to stop them? Oh, yes. They were arrested and many were burnt at the stake. Good. They bloody well deserved it if they were anything like my bank manager. What can you tell me about the castle, Mr. O'Brien? It's a fine sight now, isn't it? Dates back to the 10th century, you know. Most of the existing building was added much later, of course. Or are the ruins open to the public? Oh no, it's much too dangerous. Anyway, there's nothing of interest remaining. How can I get into the castle? Well, those walls were built specifically to stop people getting in, Mr. Stobart. But I dare say you'll find a way, if you've the will. Can you tell me about the tripod which was found at the castle? Well, there's a bone of contention and controversy. It was dug up by an Englishman of the archaeological persuasion. Who was this Englishman? Professor Pegram. The same man who dug up the gem. Do you know where I can find Pegram? You're too late to meet that fella. Is he dead? Not that. But he's gone from the village. A sore point with our esteemed host, I might add. Do you know where Pegram has gone? I'm sorry, but I don't. He oped anchor in the dark and shipped out before the dark. Why did he do that? Who knows? A guilty conscience or a secret assignation. Whatever the reason, he'll not be missed in Lachmar. Maybe now the fuss about the gem has died down. We can get back to now. What can you tell me about the gem which Pegram found? Now there's a gem which should never have been taken. A man would have to be full of greed to covet that stone. What's your interest in the jewel? You're not a reporter, are you? Oh no. Thank the Lord for that. Why is Pegram's departure upset the landlord? He's lost a paying guest, that's why. More than that, there's the question of an unsettled bid. Poor Michael's seen red over the business, and I don't blame him. Can you tell me more about the landlord? Mick Leary? He's what you call a, a would-be sophisticate. The trouble is, his idea of sophistication extends as far as putting paper in the lavatory. I never worked out why he did that. It's much too dark in there to read. That's true. Have you ever run your hand over the back of the door? The graffiti is written in braille. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? Nope. I've never seen him before. Goodbye for now. The young red-haired guy was plainly nervous about something. Mr. Fitzgerald? Doyle told me you definitely worked at the dig. He's seen you there. You might as well admit it. I knew this would happen. I knew I'd get caught. I need to talk to Professor Pegram, if he's still alive. What do you mean? Is he in danger? Yeah. You too, if I'm right. You're not from the Social Security. Hell no. What makes you think that? Well, I was claiming benefit at the same time I was working for Pegram. I'm not in a position to make judgments, Sean. That's between you and your conscience. All I want is to talk to Pegram about the gem. But he's not here! I know that. But he left that package with you, didn't he? So where did Pegram go? I don't know. I swear it. He came to see me early this morning. Said he was leaving. He asked me to give this package to a guy called Marquet. Show me what's in the package, Sean. I, I can't do that. Why not? I promised the professor. So what? You didn't have any qualms about your benefit scam. So where's the harm in taking a peek inside Pegram's package? You don't know these people. I can't. I don't dare. This is your last chance to show me the package, Fitzgerald. I've been patient with you, but now it's time to kick ass. But he'll kill me. Who will? The man from Paris. Jack Marquet. Pegram told me if I gave him the package unopened, I'd hear no more about it. But if I double-crossed Marquet, I'd be dead. I'll deal with Jacques Marquet. Give the package to me. No. Why should I trust you? I don't know who to trust anymore. 
I wish I'd never even heard of the Lockmarn gem. Hey, I just seen a big red. Get out of here, Maguire. Come back when you're old enough. What's the lad howling about? A big red sports car. Sean Fitzgerald's been run over. Get out! Noisy little tyke. Maybe you should send out some medicinal brandy maker. Oh yes. And who's going to pay for it? Not me. Me too, neither. Came across this guy, Sean Fitzgerald, who was as nervous as a long-tailed cat. He'd been given a package by P. Graham, and told to give it to someone called Jacques Marquet. I was telling the truth about Fitzy, mister. Okay, okay, calm down. Now tell me what happened. I was standing here, minding me own business, when I saw this beautiful red sports car coming up over the hill. Watch careful Watch where I Fitzgerald look dropped that, the gem. Says I. I we I must go there next. Next thing, Fitzy comes tearing out of the pub and nearly knocks me on the ass. But the car just flies at him. It was too fast for poor old Fitzy. And hit him an awful wallop. He goes flying up on top. Jesus, says I. I thought he was a goner. Next thing, the driver hops out. And I couldn't believe my eyes. He was dressed like a bloody pixie. Fitzgerald panicked when I caught him out, rushed out the pub and, was run over. By a leprechaun. Khan rented a leprechaun suit, it must be him. Hey, Maguire. What? Did this pixie have a scar on his cheek? I couldn't see. He was wearing a stupid mask. Are you a special agent? Sorry to disappoint you, kid, but I'm not. Did Fitzgerald drop anything when he was hit? I didn't see. It all happened so fast. Maybe the package fell somewhere out of sight. See you later, kid. Okay, mister. The plastic cover had been smashed and broken away, revealing a switch. I pushed the switch down but in doing so it snapped off in my hand. It was a trap door in the sidewalk. I tugged at the trap door, but it was locked from the inside. Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir? May I have another beer, please? Certainly, sir. Same again? Yeah, please. How is this stuff made? That's the secret of the master brewer, sir. Each batter is lovingly manhandled in time-honored fashion. Suspended on skillfully tied ropes of the finest hemp. Lowered into the cellar, utilizing the forces of original gravity, like manner from heaven. I'm sorry, but the pump appears to be broken. I can fix it for you. I don't think so. This is a job for a professional electrician. Oh well, at least the glass washer is still working. It's not my idea, is it? It just so happens I'm an electrician. Check out my credentials. Well, no. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> Here's a house bedeviled with faulty wiring of a wayward nature. Here's you, an electric man with a little plastic card to prove it. Hmm. I still want to see what you can do before I let you touch me beer pumps. You can make a start on the glass washer. And when you've finished that, will you take a look at the pumps?
I replaced the fuse with a piece of wire. I knew it was dangerous, but I was desperate enough to disregard everything I knew about standard safety precautions. Excuse me, Mr. Leary. I fixed your glass washer, no problem. Bingo! And a blessing to all the saints. A free half pint to that man on the house. No. Could you take a look at the beer pumps? Oh, I guess so, but I'm not making any promises. If you can't fix them, I'll have a riot on me hands. The pumps are in the cellar, right? That's right. You'll find a flashlight down there somewhere. It was the lever which locked the trap door. I pushed the lever and heard the grating of metal, but nothing appeared to happen. I lifted the trap door and an overpowering smell of stale beer rose from the cellar below. I looked down on a stone tiled floor, way too far to jump. Excuse me. There was a nasty feeling in my guts I usually associated with light opera. It was Khan. What's the problem? Did you see what happened here a few minutes ago? What was that? A man was involved in an unfortunate accident. I didn't see anything. What about the boy? Well, he doesn't know anything either. The kid, well, you know how it is in these rural communities. Not enough genes to go around. I prayed McGuire had the sense to keep his mouth shut. Was the guy hurt bad? He's been taken care of, but he thinks he dropped a small parcel. You didn't happen to find it, did you? If I had, I would have taken it to the police. Of course. Thank you. I met Khan. Face to face. He came right up to me and asked about the accident. He was looking for something, Fitzgerald must have had the gem in the package. Now all I need to do is find it. Now I could see, I spotted Mr. Leary's flashlight easily. Then I noticed a flash of light. Something sparkling beneath the open trap door. It was Pegram's gem, all right. A large, uncut blue stone. I guess I was already under its spell. Did you find it? What? Whatever you was looking for. Uh, yeah. Listen, McGuire. I want you to keep this to yourself. No problem old. Just chuck us up a crate of lager. No way, you're not old enough. We can sell it and make some cash. Forget it, kid. I couldn't betray Mr. Leary's trust. I could, for sure. That old misery guts deserves it. If you want to do me a favor, keep a lookout for that guy in the suit. Okay, but it'll cost you a pack of the chips. Oh, and shout if you see that Ferrari. Got it. Got the gem that goes with the tripod. Now I just have to figure out what to do with them. It was a large blue gemstone. It was a rectangle of toweling printed with the words, Nagopalin Stout Builds Body. It was the barman's flashlight. It was a rusty faucet. The faucet creaked, coughed, and spewed out a stream of rusty colored water. I held the towel under the faucet and soaked it with water. I shut off the faucet as tight as I could, but it kept on dripping.
The gates were made of solid, age-blackened wood. Pushing with all my strength got me nowhere. They didn't budge. I really need to start working out. The farmer's craggy face was set in a mask of aesthetic appreciation. His feet were set in a pair of manure-caked boots. Hi, do you speak English? Well, no. Uh, what if I was to say no? An implication of cognizance shrouded in denial. A pretty poser of a paradox indeed. I gave him the look I'd perfected when I was twelve and was going to be the greatest hypnotist of all time. It was a killer. Are you attempting to hypnotize me, or is it the constipation you're suffering? I was a little out of practice. What can you tell me about the castle? Not much, I'm sorry to say. Most of its history is long forgotten. Ah, but if these old stones could only speak, what stories they'd tell. Stories to make your toes curl and your blood run cold. You know, this castle is said to be over 600 years old. Have you seen Professor Pegram? No, he's packed up and gone. Do you happen to know where? Back in England, I suppose. Did you happen to see a red sports car down on the road? I caught a glimpse of a flash of red on the hill and heard the racket. Sure, it was an awful noise. A sports car, you say? A Ferrari, to be exact. A racing car? And what was it doing here? The poor fella must have been lost. The driver of the Ferrari was involved in an accident. Is that so? Yeah. He knocked somebody down outside the bar. What an idiot! How could a thing like that happen? He was traveling too fast. So fast, he ran right under the car? I mean, the car was traveling too fast. But you'd have thought the idiot could have heard it coming. Maybe you know the guy who was hit by the Ferrari. His name is Sean Fitzgerald. Oh, I know him all right. That's me nephew, the idiot responsible for the stacking of my hay cart. Was he killed by the car? Oh, no. But he has been abducted. Well, that's a relief now. Aren't you going to look for your nephew? What for? From what you say, it's too late. Well, you could report the matter to the police. Better not. Besides, what could they do? Well, they could mount a search. They have only the one bicycle between them. In a question of superior acceleration, I put me money on the Ferrari. I think you ought to know exactly what Sean has gotten himself into. I'm not sure I want to know. But you're his uncle. His own flesh and blood. You're right, but what can I do? If I'm not here to guard it, some idiot might try to climb the haystack. What a moral dilemma. Stay here and guard this potentially lethal agricultural construction. Or to go off in search of the prodigal nephew, the very man responsible for said hazard. It'll need some thinking about. Why, there's no problem. You're right. Why didn't I think of it before? We'll demolish the haystack. You don't have to demolish the haystack to go look for Sean. I'll stay here in your place and warn anyone who's silly enough to climb it. Marvelous! I think I should start me inquiries in the bar. He strode off in the direction of McDevitt's bar, leaving me to contemplate the stack of hay. On the back of the cart, was a crazily stacked tower of hay bales, leaning precariously against the castle wall. The stack of hay stopped short of the top of the wall. Even if I stretched as far as I could, the wall was out of reach. What I needed was a slice or two of Alice's Wonderland. There was a narrow crack between two of the stones where the centuries-old mortar had crumbled away. I pushed my fingers into the narrow crack. It went back several inches into the rock. I inserted the end of the lifting key in the mortarless crack and gave it a firm shove. It remained lodged in the wall, jutting out to form a step. 
there should be animation of the goat, but sadly they delete it from this version of the game. At least the goat's puzzle is little easier here. Just need to move the bench. It was a rusted piece of iron, maybe part of a plow or something. The rope by which the goat was tethered had become tangled on the old plowshare. So the ghost of Lochmarn is no more than a fierce billy goat. For a moment I thought he was going to be incredibly awkward to get past, but in the end it was surprisingly simple. Who would have known? The sack contained a fine white powder. As I dipped my fingers into the soft white powder, I realized what it was. Plaster of Paris. I'd used it in kindergarten to make casts of animal paw prints. It was a statue which had fallen from its place on the wall. Five fingers of stone projected from the back of the carving. It was a statue which had fallen from its place on the wall. Five fingers of stone projected from the back of the carving. The statue was too heavy to lift. It overbalanced into the sand. As I swung the stone upright, I noticed it had left a pattern of holes in the sand. There was a pattern of five holes arranged on the wall. They'd been drilled there deliberately. I placed my fingers and thumb into the holes in the wall. Nothing happened. Behind the altar was a carved panel decorated with animals, birds, and plants. I tried in vain to move the panel. The five fingers on the back of the statue had left their impressions in the fine sand. I sprinkled the plaster on the sand until the holes were filled. The patch of sand where the statue had fallen was covered with a dense sprinkling of plaster. The trickle of water was quickly absorbed by the plaster. I eased the solid piece of plaster from the sand. Underneath, it had formed a perfect copy of the statue. The plaster cast was a pretty neat replica of the back of the stone, complete with protruding fingers. The hardened plaster cast fitted snugly into the five matching sockets. There was a soft thud, then Silence.
That's everything for this episode guys. In the next episode, we will be again with the Nico, and finding more about Karshan and Imelda. Don't miss it. See you in the next episode.